So if you guys haven't noticed, Pastor Jim and Beth are not here today, and they are so sad that they are not here today because we have an amazing speaker lined up, um, but they wanted to say hello to you. They, of course, miss being with you guys today, and really quick before I introduce the speaker, if we can just say hello to our church online, thank you for joining us today. If you guys can give it up for everyone that joined us online today, um, we are so glad that you were able to be with us virtually um, as well. So really quick, I'm going to introduce our speaker this morning. This morning, we are lucky to have Charles Porter in his family here. Um, so Charles and Tanya met at North Central, got married. They actually attended real life while they were at North Central. And then um, when they were married, they were on staff here for a little bit. So you guys are family, right? Like once family, always family. Um, so we're really excited to have them here today. They have three wonderful children with them. They have Joshua, they have Elena, and they have Riley, who you're going to see and hear from a little bit today as well from a few of them. Um, and here's the thing that's really fun with, with Charles and Tanya. They have been serving abroad. They'll share a little bit about that too. Um, and we're just really lucky to have them here today. So they're going to jump in today and share with us and continue on our series. Um, so we're just really excited. It's going to be an awesome day. And you guys, again, once family, always family. So if you guys haven't met them before, make sure you meet them after church. Um, and if you do know them, make sure you give them lots of hugs. And I saw Julie like running to give them hugs today. So love on them this morning. Just a quick reminder, if, you're, if you've been here before, you know the drill. If you're new to real life, at the end of service, we'll break up into our connect questions and kind of just talk with the people around us. So just kind of be prepared. Who's around you? Be ready to talk to them after service, pray with them, um, and do a little community with people at the close today. Who touched me? Who touched me? Me, the unclean outcast who hasn't touched anyone for 12 years. 12 years since my father hugged me. 12 years since I last danced at a wedding party with my friends. 12 years since anyone last invited me over to the house. 12 years since I last sat on anyone's couch. Where were you 12 years ago? Do you remember 12 years ago? Who touched me, me, the woman who 12 years ago had a livelihood, had an inheritance 12 years ago, I had a life. Then the bleeding started. At first we thought I would heal naturally, but then time went on and that didn't happen. Uncle Abram sent me to a rabbi in the mountains, Aunt Esther to the valley. Eat this, drink this, wear this. A, di a rabbi tried to cast demons out of me. I've tried everything. I've tried all the lotions, all the oils, all the potions I could get my hands on until um, I ran out of money. Then nobody wanted anything to do with me anymore. Who touched me? And always the constant exhaustion, but the worst bit of it was the constant isolation from the world. <sighs> Moses, the lawgiver, Moses said, any piece of cloth that touched me, any furniture, any piece of utensil, every single last connection to the world, Unclean, ritually unclean. Can you imagine a situation where you can't touch anyone for 12 years? Who touched me? The only people who would associate with me were pagans. And they don't believe in God. I do. I did, and I still do. Who touched me? Rumors were that this rabbi... Just by touching him, people are healed. Happened two weeks ago in Capernaum. Who touched me. But it's risky. Very risky. What if I touch him and it doesn't work? I will have made a holy man unclean. And crowds follow him everywhere. What if he's walking too fast and I can't keep up? Worst of all, what if they notice me? 
Every single person I touch in the crowd will be unclean. They could stone me. They just might. Who touched me? But then, what do I have to lose? If I could just touch the hem, no, just the tip of a tassel, I know, I know he can heal me. Here it comes. Who touched me? I did. Now it's time to come clean because for the first time in 12 years, I am clean. Thank you, Alana. I think a woman's perspective is a little bit better delivered from a woman. <laughs> I don't know what that would be like, but if you haven't figured out this morning, we're going to try to answer the question, who touched me? In our series of Why Jesus Asked Questions. So good morning. My name is Charles Porter. Nice to see some of you. You've gotten so skinny. I've lost my hair. That was something that most everybody has mentioned since I'm here. Um, and I'm a little nervous, I'll be honest, uh, mostly because like, I have 30 minutes to convince a room that's largely strangers to make complete changes in your life based on a little bit of information that I'm going to give you. It's sort of an impossible task, right? Because really, you shouldn't. <laughs> but maybe the Holy Spirit will speak to you this morning through His Word and through not a statement that I make, but a question that Jesus asks each of us, who touched me? A little background on us as a family. Um, yeah, we were on staff here and then we wandered off to the Sudan uh, six weeks after September 11th and spent a couple years there, Tanya and I. We uh, found Joshua in Kenya and adopted him, had two other children who came along lately, uh, later. One of them was born in Africa, one was born in France, one born in St. Cloud. And our current work is coaching and mentoring pastors and leaders. You're like, wow, that doesn't sound exciting. Um, it's actually very interesting because I've done the adventure. I've bungee jumped the Nile and almost drowned. I have been charged by a 650-pound gorilla and surrounded by wild elephants. I have walked over villages, into villages that have no paved road, and uh, carried out some American youth pastors who were not in shape, and we literally had to carry them over the mountain with a heat stroke. I've done all of that. And you know what I found in those journeys? I found that I can have the answer, but unless people have questions that you answer, it rarely makes a difference. So I went back to school. Why? Because I noticed that I could tell you everything I wanted, but having the answer is what, it's not enough. I needed better questions, better questions to ask. And so I went back and I trained as an executive coach, and most of what I do now is just sitting with people and asking them questions. Because here's what I've found. Let me give you an example. Okay, let's say, that what's, what's the most common New Year's resolution in America? Lose weight. Yes, exactly. Every single year, millions of people make this resolution, I'm going to move, lose weight. And so if you come to me and I'm to doing the old style, well, well, here's what you need to do. You need to do X, Y, Z, right? And three weeks from now, you will weigh more than you weighed today, the research says, right? Now, what if we did this instead? Let me ask each of you, what do you know about good nutrition? Just think for a second. Right. Is there anybody here that says, I know nothing about good nutrition? Okay. The second question I would have for you, what do you know about the effects of exercise? I, anybody here not know? Right. I mean, I don't know if 60 miles is good for you. <laughs> okay. Like there are these hybrid versions of humans that uh, are called Brent Silkey and his buddies. Uh, and I love Brent, uh, but he's a cyborg. Like there's something that's just, he's awesome. Go. Yeah. But so how many of you could not answer those two questions? So if you know the effects of good nutrition and you know the effects of exercise, where's the gap between your current reality and your knowledge? Now we can talk. 
Because when we're willing to face the gap in knowledge that we have, that's when you begin to take ownership for your life and not me giving you more information. Because friends, we have more information. And if you don't have it, just ask ChatGPT. It does. So I'm like, what is he talking about? If you know, you know, okay? And no, I did not write my sermon using ChatGPT, okay? Jesus loves to use questions. Because questions cut to the heart of the real issues. Questions are shortcuts to helping us embrace our own responsibility. And change almost always begins with a question. Do you want to live like this? Is this enough for you? What do you want to see change? Change almost never begins with more information. And yet when we share the gospel, when we go to people, what do we do? We give them information, information, information. Here's what you need to know. I don't have that question. Yes, but you need to know that Jesus loves you. I don't care. You need to know that there's eternity. I don't care. What's your question? Where can I eat? How do I belong? How do I fix my marriage? How do I survive my divorce? How do I deal with terminal illness? How do I live in a world that doesn't believe like me? You see, friends, if we're giving information and people don't have questions, then it just goes right over us. And every parent knows this to be true when you talk to your kids. Why does every parent begin with, why did you do that? What were you thinking? Now, if you just tell the kid, are they listening? Like the older the person is in the room, the more they're smiling right now because you've done it multi-generations. <laughs> Giving your kids information doesn't work. What were you thinking? Oh, I thought it sounded like fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did too. I thought jumping off a platform over the Nile sounded like fun. It was. Yeah. <laughs> Two comments real quick before we get to our scripture. We're going to be talking, obviously, about the woman with the issue of blood today that Jesus touched. And a lot of people, if you've been around church, you know this story. And we'll pick up the story. But I want to mention two different things from Alana's monologue. One, who touched me? Well, science for a long time now has known that just touch has healing properties. That babies in the NICU, they get their parents to touch them and hold them because there's something about physical touch that creates biochemical responses in the human body that bring about healing. Can you imagine this woman for 12 years she had not been hugged? A couple of my kids are cuddly, a couple are not. Wait, I only have three kids. So one, anyway, so I'm not throwing anybody under the bus there, okay? <laughs> But years ago, I started this thing where I would make them stand there and give me a hug for 20 seconds. Now, for you that are bristly type people, and, you know, some of you are like 20 seconds. That's not, that's just starting. Like for some of us, like, okay, you know, try it today with the people you love. Because at 20 seconds, science shows that positive endorphins are released in your body. And actually notice how rarely you touch somebody for 20 seconds. It's very rare. In India, there's a subcast of people. The lowest of the low of the low are called untouchables. Because the worst thing that you can do to a human being is make them untouchable. When Tanya and I left here, we began our work in the Sudan. And it was really weird, i got to be honest, because guys there touch a lot more than guys in the States. Like guys, we do this pat thing. Ch -ch -ch -ch. How you doing? Good. We move on, right? If, okay, I'm, I'm talking to myself. But uh, <laughs> in Sudan, men would hold hands. And so my first Sunday, there was a church gathering, a lot of internationals there, and there was this huge Nigerian missionary, Namdi. And Namdi walks up and he grabs my hand, not to shake it, to hold it. And already I'm like, whoa, like this is not my Minnesota nice type thing, you know? And then he starts swinging my hand. <laughs> Pastor Charles, how you doing, man? <gasps> not good, thank you. Like I am really uncomfortable here. This is now not how touch happens. But we went from there, we went out to Sudan, uh, to Kenya. And my wife was working a plan because she wanted to adopt. And I'll be honest, I, I just didn't really know. 
And so on my 30th birthday, we went down to the orphanage, and she cheated. She went off, and she was playing with this little girl. And they brought out two little babies, and one was a cute kid. I can handle cute. Like, we all scroll Instagram and TikTok and see the cute babies, right? Don't ever hold one. <laughs> right? Because he's 19 years old sitting there right now, okay? That's what happens. Parents, don't ever let your kid hold that puppy or that kid. And for goodness sake, don't you dare hold it yourself. Why? Because there's something changes when we're touched and when we touch. And my friends, there is a promise in Scripture that God wants to touch us. Jesus spent his ministry walking around, and he touched people. And that's what happens. Now, let's actually pick up the story. And so I'd like my son Riley to come up and just quote this story for us. So Riley, would you come? And let me just set this up. Notice that there are two women in this story. We're going to tell the story of the first one. Son? Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house, because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touch me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, go in peace. Your faith has healed you. Thank you, son. A little interesting a woman who had been sick and a 12-year-old girl who was sick. I love this story because it helped me with my daughter. Best parenting moment I ever had because my daughter, when she was six or seven, I'm a big girl, daddy, I did it. And then I'm reading the scripture. I said, look, do you believe the Bible? Yeah. Well, the Bible says that the 12-year-old was a little girl. So you're daddy's little girl. I want to tell you something changed. She became daddy's little girl again because the Bible said she was daddy's little girl until she's 13. But she said, daddy, when I turn 13, you can't call me a big girl. Uh, it starts to mean something different as a teenager. I get that. Um, this woman was taking a huge risk because she had an issue of blood. Well, for in our society, we don't really talk about I mean, they advertise on TV about feminine products, but guys, I learned a lot when I got married, okay? Stuff I had no idea about, and I still don't want to know, okay? And, you know, we just, there's issues we don't talk about, right? And, I mean, there's stuff that, you know, they advertise on TV for guys and, like, blue pills and stuff, but we don't have these in common conversations, right? But in Mosaic Law, because of the risk of infectious diseases and this kind of thing, if you had bleeding, you were excluded from the community, you were unclean. And there were good reasons for this. But if you were suffering, your social isolation, your exclusion from the family of God, from the people of God, from the worship, must have been completely excruciating. I'll give you a little sidebar here just real quick. One of the misconceptions about Christianity is honestly about women. If you look in the book of Luke, if you look throughout the New Testament, Jesus often makes women the hero of the stories. And it's fascinating, the woman who gave the last might. It wasn't the guy who gave the last thing, it was the woman. And in this story, we find Luke telling us critical things about the nature of God through his interaction with valuing the lives of two women who were devalued in society. Just a little sidebar. But this story is, tr is strange. Now, some of you probably like me. You like The Chosen. I know it's a little cheesy and, you know, whatever. But it's a great show because you don't have to worry about language and all this kind of stuff. So The Chosen is this kind of historical reenactment of Jesus' life. And I like it. And this, the version of this, you can look at it afterwards on YouTube, is really good. But they miss it just a little bit because it's a little too Hollywood. Because in the Hollywood version, she kind of breaks for, she touches him. And he does kind of like Iron Man with the first... Um, 
arc reactor. Like too much power goes down. Whoa! And he sucked down. Like, whoa! What happened to me? Somebody touched me. I'm sorry. No. Like, no. Just no. Jesus was fully God and he was fully man. By tap, tapping into his power, he is not diminished in any way when we reach out to him. Nothing you do, nothing you say, nothing you ask of him can ever diminish him in any way. Somehow you think that your sin can influence him, that his forgiveness could somehow suck down the grace that he has, the power that he has. It's simply not possible that the worst thing you've ever done could diminish the power of his grace in any single instance. So if power isn't the issue, what's going on here? Who touched me? Now, two chapters before in Luke, I was looking at this this week or two weeks ago when Jim was like, hey, can you speak? And I was like, sure, I'll look at this. I started looking at this. I'm like, I don't remember another time when just by touching people are healed. And then I'm looking at Luke and all of a sudden, yeah, this has actually happened before. Like two chapters before, people are just coming and touching me and boom, 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 boom. Everybody's getting healed. So why are they making a big deal about this woman? What's different in this story from the others. You see, people were coming to touch the power of God. But why pick on this poor woman, rejected, broken, taken advantage of? Why single her out in front of the crowd and risk that she would be known, that she'd polluted everybody that she had touched? What are you doing, Jesus? Like, that's not real nice. Why don't you do like with the guy that you healed at the water? Find him later. Find her later and keep it quiet. Why did you call her out? I mean, these are the questions that I ask myself. I don't know. The woman comes and tells her story. How embarrassing must it have been? I mean, like we just don't talk about this stuff, right? And in front of a whole crowd, he says to her, what's going on? There's um, uh, some sort of perspective in Christianity that's gotten a little warped, I think. We have to have it all together. Not before we become followers of Jesus, because everybody understands that, you know, if you're a sinner, you should probably be a good one, right? Like, if you don't believe in Jesus, I mean, literally, seriously, like, if you don't believe in Jesus, why? I mean, there's no moral code, but if you come to Jesus, we know that Jesus changes us and Jesus transforms us and he gave his life for us to save us and all that. And because of that, we feel like after we come to Jesus, we have to suddenly become these perfect versions of ourselves. And so somehow there's this shame that comes in when we don't match up to what we feel is the standard of following Jesus. Or if we have physical problems. Last summer, I haven't talked about this much, but uh, came home from Montreal. Um, and I had some sort of emotional, psychological, mental, physical breakdown. Like I had adrenaline surges for seven hours a day. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't work. I was a complete mess. And I'm donor supported. Like this church gives us money to do ministry. And some of you individually over the years have supported us. And I have churches writing me, what are you doing to save souls for Jesus? I'm like, ah, I'm on my couch shaking right now and I can't deal with life. What do I tell you? So I wrote him back. I told him the truth. <laughs> like, I don't know. I'm sick. And I'm not processing life very well right now. And I don't know what to tell you. And if you want to stop your support, that's fine. But I can't. I can't perform right now. I can't be the missionary. I speak five languages. I've tried, worked on three different continents, planted churches. We've done university ministry. And I'm a, I can't, like, I went to church and I saw another pastor and I had a panic attack and wanted to run out of the building. I don't say that so you pity me. I'll say that because 
Following Jesus doesn't make you perfect or immune. Following Jesus is an invitation to say there is somebody who will touch you when you are broken. The offer is always there. And it's not just for people who don't know Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus, who have never given your life to him. That offer is on the table. But if you do know Jesus and you just feel like you're kind of a crappy Christian. Oops, I shouldn't say crap. But you're a bad Christian. Okay? See, I'm not a good one, right? Okay, if you needed any proof, I'm not that great Christian. If you don't have it all together. You're invited. You're invited to come and taste and see that the Lord is good. Not only that, you're invited to be in community. I remember one of my friends got saved one day. He got saved. A friend had been witnessing to him at work. And he's like, he and his, they, they use salty language. And he's like, man, you know, like our Heavenly Father, he's blankety blank blank proud of us. I'm like, yep. He is, <laughs> all right? He didn't know. He just knew that blankety blank, Heavenly Father was blankety blank proud, proud of him. And I'm not going to sit there and say, hey, you know, today he probably wouldn't use that language. But what did it matter? Did he knew that the Father loved him no matter what? Look at how Jesus speaks to this woman. He says, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. The first thing that he says to her, he calls her daughter. Her shame, her disease had excluded her from the family of God. And he said, no, you're my family. And then he says, your faith has healed you. Another way of saying that is your faith has brought you sozo, the Greek word there, which is the same word we use for salvation. As Christians, we believe God, Jesus was right when he says that God is love. We believe it's true that God so loved the world that he sent Jesus. We believe that faith in Jesus is the road to having a restored relationship with God, knowing his deep love for us. We also believe that God loves us, whether we return that love or not. These are all foundational things. But this next little bit, let me just give you for something for some of you guys who've been around for a little while in the Christian faith. And if you're new, kind of, you know, you sit back maybe just a second. But once there's kind of two different perspectives in the church around God. One is this extreme sovereignty of God. And this says God knows all and is all powerful. That's true. God has a plan and he does as he wills. And so we see this guy uh, in some of the miracles of Jesus. Like the person's not looking for Jesus. He's not trying to find. Boom, just God. Jesus just sovereignly steps in and changes his life well one of the things that happens with that is then why do I need to do anything like what there's no role for me in this relationship because if God knows all and sees all and does all then what point is there nothing I had a guy one time say to me nothing you say or do matters at all in the eternal destiny of anybody well then why bother like I'm going fishing (laughs) Like, I like fishing. I'd rather sit on a boat and hunt for walleye the rest of my life. Why bother going to Africa? Why bother running all these miles? Why bother? But this woman says to herself, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. You see, Christianity does not take our agency away from us, our power away from us, our ability to go to God. Yes, it is true that God comes towards us and there are sovereign acts of God, but that never means that he took away from us the ability to come in and come close to him. And that's the beautiful mystery that God comes towards us and we at any time can move towards him. You see, I know my kids love me, but I still like to hear them say it. God knows, but he still responds to our action, and that is genuine. Ladies, you want your husband to know, you want to know that your husband loves you, right? And my great-grandfather was famous, for just, he told my grandmother, she said, why don't you say you ever love me? Well, I told you once, if it changes, I'll tell you again. <laughs> like, like I told you, it's good enough for you, right? Any woman here want that to be your relationship? No, we don't. And God responds to our movement towards him, however weak and anemic and just barely touch it might be. 
The woman said to herself, she took action and touched the hem of his garment and she made him clean. I think it's Aaron, are you going to come up here and make me spirit, sound spiritual by playing a little music as I close? <laughs> I think there's something. Oh, you're already there. Sweet. I love that. Make me sound spiritual here. <laughs> but I still haven't asked why Jesus said, who touched me? We know that we have the power to move towards God. We know that this woman had been shamed by our society, but she had the courage to move, and she was welcomed in and forgiven all this. But why does Jesus say, who touched me? When I did my training as an executive coach, they taught us there's multiple different who, what, when, where, and how. Remember the questions from from school? What is information? What do you think you're doing? Why did you do that? Why is often accusing Like, you want to make somebody mad? Why did you do that? Like, does anybody like why? How? Just ask for information. Where is a location? But who? Who is always a relational question. She goes from this nameless, faceless entity that sucked power out of his divinity to a real person. He wanted to know her. What you think about that? He wanted to know who this woman was. He didn't just care about her condition. He didn't just care about healing her, about taking care of her eternity. He wanted to know who she was. Wow. When I was in um, Montreal, I was privileged to be the... uh, interim pastor at a church who lost their pastor during the um, COVID and he moved on to another position so they asked me to step in so for seven months I guided this church through their transition and um, I get a call or I get an email from the secretary one day hey some, somebody wants to talk to you I'm like great some random person that was watching on the internet during COVID what is this going to be like and it was the most amazing conversation so I called this lady. She said, can I come be baptized? Said, what are you talking about? She said, um, I've been listening online. And as you speak, I just start crying. Ain't none of you crying after my speaking today. <laughs> like, it's a, she's just weeping through my sermons. She said, I wanted to be a follower of Jesus when I was in my teens but I just didn't do it and began to tell her about Jesus and she, she starts crying she's just like I'm at work I'm at work and I'm crying I gotta stop this conversation like yeah you're, you're, you're but what happened Jesus touched her but she wanted to respond and she wanted to come and tell people I have met Jesus who knows me now? Who touched me? The promise of this question is that Jesus wants to know you. Your shame, your guilt, all of that, he'll take care of. Nothing you do or say can re- remove you from his love. But who touched me is a promise for today. It's a question for you and I to come and say, when was the last time we moved towards God and said, if I could just touch just a little of the goodness of heaven, a little of the grace and mercy of almighty divinity, that might be enough for me, but that's not enough for Jesus because Jesus wants to know you. He wants to call you by name. He wants you to be in the family. He wants you to stop believing these lies that what you've done have isolated you from him. And so this morning, I ask you, who here has touched Jesus? And if so, do you know that he wants to know your name? That he wants to respond to that move? So this morning, I'm just going to pray. I'm going to invite you to 
say, Lord, I want to touch you. But more than that, I want to know you. And I want to be known by you. I want to be called son. I want to be called daughter. Um, and I'm also going to pray. I believe in divine healing. I believe that there may be some people here this morning who need a touch from God. I see some friends who've been healed. And I know some of you are probably, if in a room this size, there's always stuff. I'll be honest, there may be some ladies going through some stuff. There usually is. You don't have to tell us. Nobody's coming forward. <laughs> there may be some guys who are dealing with some stuff. And you don't feel like you can tell anybody or talk to anybody. Jesus knows. And he wants to touch you. So there's an opportunity to access the throne of God and the saving power, mercy, healing of God as we pray. And so I just ask you to reach out and by faith receive that healing. Tanya and I went seven, ten years with infertility and God touched Tanya and he healed her. Some ladies at a church without pressuring her, without, they just began to fast and pray and God touched Tanya. And you saw the two results of that prayer up on stage this morning. I tried to get the others but they wouldn't do it. So <laughs> that's a bit their personality. So. Healing is available. But some of you have been allowing the circumstances of your life to say, you know what, I'm not good enough. I'm not, I haven't lived up enough to the ideals of Christianity. How could Jesus want relationship with me? Please don't minimize his grace, his love, his mercy, the power to flow through you. So in this moment, could you just say, Lord, okay, I'm willing to be known. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. Thank you that you gave us this story of this courageous woman who in spite of her circumstances, in spite of her shame, in spite of everything that had happened to her, she moved towards you and received healing. But Lord, I love the story that you weren't content with just her being healed. You wanted to know her. You wanted to be in relationship with her. This week, as we discuss in a few minutes and as we move forward, would you show us how to be known, how to allow ourselves to open up and be known by you. And we pray this in the mighty and the powerful name of Jesus who heals, who saves, and who sends us in peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.